A week from tonight, we'll be seeing results pouring in right here as we cover all things people, power, and politics. The 2024 race is in its final leg. Welcome to The Pulse. I'm Rupert Raj. More campaign visits, a question about the barrage of political text messages, and an update on early voting in person. That's all ahead, so let's go. And a week after two prominent Arab American groups say they're not endorsing either candidate, one imam says, hey, vote the Trump ticket. We're asking him why he's leaning that way. Plus, hearing from the publisher of the Arab American News about their decision. Another key demographic in this year's race, women voters. A Democratic congresswoman is talking about what Harris needs to do to maintain support among all Democrats and that group, as well as the state of the race as it stands. The first to the campaign trail, where it's the final push for votes for the presidential candidates and their running mates as well. And one of those running mates made a stop in our state. Former President Trump's VP nominee, Senator J.D. Vance. He started his day off in Saginaw before heading west for a rally in Holland. Now Vance talked not only about the border but another topic he and Trump have been hitting the Biden administration about inflation. You're paying more than a thousand dollars a month just to afford the basic necessities, the things that you could have afforded for much less when Donald J. Trump was president of the United States. Home prices in Michigan are 41 percent higher under Kamala Harris's leadership. And importantly, and this one really worries me because this suggests our fellow citizens are hurting, credit card delinquencies are up over 9% in this country. Vance will be in another key battleground state tomorrow, Pennsylvania. That's where he'll hold a town hall with former Democratic Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard, who's now endorsing the Trump ticket. To the other side of the ticket is her running mate, Tim Walz, campaigns out in Georgia. Vice President Harris is trying to draw a stark contrast between herself and her opponent. She gave a speech at the Ellipse in D.C. tonight. If that location sounds familiar for you, here's why. That's where former President Donald Trump spoke on January 6, 2021, where he falsely said the election was stolen in a speech that inspired that Capitol mob and attack as they tried to stop the certification of President Biden's victory. Harris was trying to draw a contrast between herself and Trump during that speech tonight, pledging to put the country over her party and herself. She addressed the division we've seen in the country, saying it doesn't have to be this way, and then made this promise to Americans. Look, I'll be honest with you, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes, but here's what I promise you. I will always listen to you, even, even if you don't vote for me. I will always tell you the truth, even if it is difficult to hear. I will work every day to build consensus and reach compromise to get things done. And if you give me the chance to fight on your behalf, there is nothing in the world that will stand in my way. The vice president will be in North Carolina and Pennsylvania tomorrow before heading to Arizona and Nevada on Thursday. Former President Trump was in Pennsylvania tonight for a rally in Allentown. But before that, he spoke to the media at his Mar-a-Lago home in Florida, where he took up the border issue. Trump made this pledge if he gets back into office. For the first time under my administration, we will be seizing the assets of the criminal gangs and drug cartels. And we will use those assets to create a compensation fund to provide restitution for the victims of migrant crime, and the government will help in the restoration. Uh, Trump will rally in North Carolina tomorrow before heading to Wisconsin with former Green Bay Packers quarterback Brett Favre. But Trump also talked about that controversial rally at Madison Square Garden over the weekend where several crude remarks were made, including a comedian making this comment about Puerto Rico. I don't know if you guys know this, but there's literally a floating island of garbage in the middle of the ocean right now. Yeah, I think it's called Puerto Rico. Now, Trump spoke about the Madison Square Garden rally at Mar-a-Lago today. Here's what he had to say. Politicians that have been doing this for a long time, 30 and 40 years, said there's never been an event so beautiful. It was like a love fest, an absolute love fest, and it was my honor to be involved. 
Now, I should point out Trump has used the same term to describe what happened the day of the Capitol attack as well. But let's focus on the election in general. Campaign commercials have been a thing for decades, but recent ones have a new wrinkle, text messages. And they might have you asking, how the heck did they get my number? So this barrage of messages got us wondering, does it motivate you to vote early? We hit the streets to get a pulse check tonight. Here's what many of you told us. No, they don't motivate me to go. Um, and I wish that actually there were more information about where you can vote early. No, they don't. And can you tell me maybe a little bit why? Oh, they're a little bit annoying. It's annoying to get more texts. Uh, no, they don't. And explain a little bit why. Uh, I vote absentee, so I've already turned in my ballot incentive to vote to stop with the text messages, right? We also asked you the question on fox2detroit.com. If you want to weigh in, just scan the QR code at the bottom right of your screen. So far, the vast majority of you say no, they don't motivate you to vote. And you can see it's not even close over there with the vast majority, it's 99% to one. It's not a scientific poll, but it's pretty indicative of how tired people are. You know, we're getting updates on early voting every day, so that can mean only one thing. It's time to go by the numbers here on The Pulse. This is the first number you need to know about. One 1.6 million. That's how many absentee ballots have been turned in so far in this general election. The second one, 389,000. That's how many people in Michigan have taken advantage of early voting in our state. Again, this is the first major election this has been an option. And here's the third early voting number, 27%. That's how many active registered voters have actually cast a ballot either early, in person, or by returning their absentee ballot. And by the way, if you aren't registered to vote, you can register and vote on the same day at your city or township clerk's office. In one of the major stories in our state, the lack of an endorsement by two Arab American groups because of the war in Gaza. Next, we're speaking to with an imam who says he's throwing his support behind former President Trump. You'll hear from him. This is The Pulse on Fox 2. Back now on The Pulse, it's people, power, and politics less than a week from Election Day. A major story last week was two prominent Arab American groups declining to endorse a candidate for president. But the man sitting next to me says they should consider former President Trump. Imam Husham Al Husseini is in the hot seat tonight, and we thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, sir. It's an honor. It's an honor to have you here, thank and you. Uh, an important topic as people make up their minds about this election. Let's zoom out a little bit and talk about um, what you thought about former President President Trump's stance on the conflict in Gaza before you met him uh, just a few days ago? Well, Gaza is a genocide area and it's a, a bloodshed field. It is a killing field and that is an unfortunate. Whether uh, a Jewish was kidnapped or whether uh, Muslims are prisoners in the West Bank, we, I believe, we are a children of Ibrahim, whether Christian, Jewish, Muslim. As you know, we are two billions Muslim around the world. We can't go to the heaven unless we believe in Jesus and Moses and the Torah and the Bible. And you believe that President Biden, uh, in the way he's handled this, you, you don't believe that he handled it in a way that, no, he that was, failed. was he's, he's too weak. Unfortunately, I am not Republican. I'm not Democrat. I voted for Obama twice. But uh, Mr. Biden looks very weak. And I think Ms. Harris is continuing that weak policy because I've heard Mr. Biden saying last year, last October, he's not going to allowed the war in Gaza to go on till the new year. Come on, we have another year passed, and here he is, he want to do it. He want to do what he cannot do in one year, he want to do it in one week. Come so on. Vice President Harris will would argue perhaps that, look, I wasn't president, I'm the vice president, I don't have the keys to the car, so to speak. Would you not want to give an opportunity to her to see if he, she could change course? Well... I've been here 50 years since President Nixon, and I have seen so many elections. I lived two-thirds of my life in this country, and I've, I'm watching news uh, and TV and the newspaper. Uh, I don't think she's going to do it. Even though she is a vice president, she should share, and she 
is the co-pilot. She should do something. And when, I'm sorry, but I think there is a political coup happened when they overthrow Mr. Biden. They said he's too weak. He cannot do it. But now, when they receive the power, they start reusing him again, and they said, we're going to be different. You have the power to change so the difference. What do you think Donald Trump would do so differently than Kamala Harris if he was to become president again? Well, first of all, America need a strong president. Even though I am a Muslim, I'm from Iraq, but I lived in this country for, like I said, 50 years. I have five children, 10 grandchildren, and uh, I think this country, it is the best nation the human being history ever developed. So we cannot lose it like that. We cannot take a chance. We need somebody strong, good with the people, and good with God. So you believe that Donald Trump fits all of those those priorities for you? He is much better than the other, and he's closer to God. And here, I brought a dollar with me. This dollar, which is the strongest currency in the world, it, it is not because of the financial depth. It's because in God we trust. That's what made America great, and that's what made the dollar strong. So if you go against God, and if you wanted to oppose the Bible and the Torah and the Quran by supporting same-sex marriage, you are not going to be blessed. So you're going to oppose God. So it sounds it sounds to me like you're actually following a little bit of the Republican, uh, some of the uber and ultra conservative talking points here in terms of what you believe to be a strong nation. You're talking about some social issues and some other things, but I'm asking you yes. specifically about Donald Trump when it comes to handling the situation in Gaza. Yes. He has shown uh, a friendship and a kinship with Benjamin Netanyahu. Has invited him to his home in Mar-a-Lago. That didn't uh, change your mind at all to see that kind of kinship. First of all, when there is a problems between the children of Abraham, Christian, Jewish, Muslims, now it happens that the Christian are the strongest in the world, and they are mediate between the Jewish and the Muslim. That's a great position. Now, I have heard Mr. Trump, and I believed him, that he said he's going to stop wars, whether in Ukraine and Europe, or whether in Asia and Middle East. That's it's going to but be Imam, his in friendship, God will, his and he's closer to the Bible and to the Quran and to the Torah. So, my friend, we need to go back to the great America to speak one language under one God. Uh, f forgive me one second. The, the, the Bible was revealed in Aramic language, and the Torah was revealed in Hebrew, and Quran was revealed in Arabic, but they all come and go from one God. So we need to read between the line the holy language. So I know that it's hard to separate the religious part of this from the policy point, but I want to go back to policy yes, sir. and ask you again, yes, sir. the friendship that Benjamin Netanyahu has in former President Trump, yeah. that doesn't change your impression or your mind about how he'll handle no, Gaza? He, he's, not, he's, he's making mistakes, and America is not happy with him, but he is so smart that he is using the little time to do what he wants because the election is coming very close, and they cannot oppose him because the Jewish lobby is very strong here. Let's listen to what Osama Sablani, who is with the Arab American News, who sent out 75,000 uh, letters to Arab Americans in Dearborn. This is what he has to say. He disagrees with the respectful imam here. Take a listen. The Arab American News uh, and Arab American Public uh, uh, Arab American uh, Political Action Committee have already made the decision. We're printing over 75,000 fl flyers. We're sending it to 75,000 homes. We are asking people not to vote for both candidates, but to vote down on the ballot. 2016, Arab American News, the Arab American News, and Arab American PAC decided not to endorse either uh, candidate, uh, Hillary Clinton for the Democrat or uh, Donald Trump for the uh, Republican. And what happened is, uh, in, in that year, that Hillary Clinton lost by 10,700 votes, approximately. Uh, so maybe uh, we don't know what's going to happen this year, but uh, we have made the same decision not to endorse. In 2020, however, both of us, the Arab American PAC and the Arab American News, endorsed uh, uh, Biden, Joe Biden. And we have paid heavily for it in the last 12 months.
on the show on 101 when people I people I, I'm contrarian because I'm speaking for people who aren't in this room including many people who would argue Imam that uh, this is a president who had the Muslim ban uh, in effect in 2017 and decided that uh, it would he would close kind of those doors and borders is this someone who you trust with uh, with your uh, your future okay I'm an immigrant but I came here in the 73 to study an aeronautical engineer so I was legal immigrant and we welcome any legal immigrant but you're this not afraid a, of anything that he'll do no no this is this is a country of his, his wife is uh, sure. uh, uh, coming from um, uh, Europe so uh, anybody is welcome this is America for all but don't bring me a, a criminal don't bring me weird people because one virus could pollute the whole body, social body. I want to say thank you, Imam. I know we only had limited time, but I want to thank you for joining us here on The Pulse tonight. It was good to see sure, you. Sure, welcome. And my good friend, Osama Siblani, we, he's my friend, but we opposed about Saddam issue. He was... You disagree was, was on against, a lot of big and issues. And now we disagree. On this and the but Saddam we're still issue. Well, I appreciate that. That's the you, kind sir. of decency and decorum that thank we like you. to see. Thank, thank you, Imam, for your God time bless today. You. It's an honor. Another key demographic in this election and every election the female vote we're sitting down with congresswoman debbie dingle as we go down to the wire in this election you're watching the pulse on fox 2. Welcome back to The Pulse. You know the mission, people, power, and politics. Joining us now to talk about the female vote and the state of the race in general, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell. It's good to see you. Thanks for joining us. We only have a few minutes. Uh, all right, so if the election was tomorrow, tonight, as of tonight, if the election was tomorrow, who would win? Quite frankly, Rupe, I do not know. I think the election is tight in Michigan. I do not believe either candidate has won it. And I think everybody really needs to understand that democracy is about their being involved, their being engaged, and their voting. And who votes between now, because we have in-person voting, they may have an AV ballot they haven't returned, or they can go to the poll on election day. Who votes is going to determine the outcome of this election. How confident are you after these results come in that both parties will be satisfied enough to accept who won? So. I'm going to be very honest. I, I have taken a pledge. What happened? How pe I will accept it. But um, I have already had threats of people that are telling me I better have a place to hide if Donald Trump doesn't win on election day. We've seen some other things that have happened. So I hope. Uh, what I want to do is work with all my colleagues, Republicans and Democrats. I want to work with every Michigander across this state. We have to believe our democracy is strong because we believe in the fairness and the safety of the election process. I'm going to ask you a tough question because this is this is grating to so many people. This whole existential threat on our country, our democracy, and our future that people place on the shoulders of Kamala Harris or Donald Trump on both sides are fighting like dogs. And when people say things like, if Donald Trump gets into office, then the country the way we know it will end. Do you really believe that? And this is what I'm going to say. You have to listen to some of the things that Donald Trump says. And some of the things that he is saying uh, uh, deeply disturb me. Uh, and that he's going to use his military to go after his political enemies. Uh, he's going to let there be chaos and, and violence the first day of office. And some of the other things he said. But I want to go beyond that. But Congressman, okay? real quickly, he in 2016 said he was going to lock Hillary Clinton up. He never did. He said a lot of things but when he was running But he did say he was going to do a Muslim ban. It was one of the first things he tried to do, and he couldn't do it. But, there, I don't, there, but I, this is what I want to say. It isn't just on them. It's on all yes, of us. That's the bigger issue. What what has happened that we are normalizing the attacks on each other, the the viciousness, the vitriolicness. If I could just show you some of the emails and the texts that I've gotten in the last week, I think people would be bothered by it. And what we all, we can disagree agreeably. If someone wants to vote for Donald Trump, I try to it changed their mind, but I respect them. They've got that but right. But don't you think that the, the both parties, Democrats and Republicans, have a moral responsibility from a campaign point of view to not pose an existential threat every time someone puts up uh, a picture of their opponent? I mean, to say that if Kamala Harris gets into office, that the country the way we know it is just going to end, or saying that about Donald Trump, is unfair, and that's what fuels the vitriol that you're speaking it about. It is some right? of what fuels. But 
I think, look, I don't like the way that we're all talking to each other. Yeah. I don't, it, it's being normalized. It's totally being normalized, Ruth. But I'm also going to tell you that I don't think Kamala Harris has said some of the things that should scare people about what will happen when they're president. I don't like the the enemies list. He's political enemies, and uh, I don't like what he's threatening to do. But when they say democracy as at, is at stake here, when you say words like that, those mean but things to people, But right? oh, let me ask you this question. Has he not said that this will be the last election they ever have to vote in? So what does that imply? Well, he says a lot of things, and so does Kamala Harris. Let me ask you a little bit about... She doesn't say things like well, that. Well, I know she doesn't say things like that, and that's true. But I, I will say, when I talked to Steve Moore, who's the uh, architect of Trump's economy back in 2016, when he says, hey, when Trump says there's going to be a 200% tariff, he's just making a point. He's trying to make a case. He's using hyperbole. Not to defend Donald Trump, but to explain what some of his defenders say about him. That's their explanation. But let's move forward and talk a little bit about the issues. Uh, when it comes to inflation, how confident are you that a President Harris could really rein this in? I think that she is very committed to doing that. I think if you talk to the economists, you talk to the Wall Street Journal economists, Donald Trump's plan will create inflation that they think her plan is better. Donald Trump talks about giving billionaires tax cuts. He talks, he helps, he did. This is a fact. He gave tax incentives to companies who were locating overseas. But our economy was pretty strong under Donald Trump, wasn't it? Our economy, we lost 8,900 jobs in Michigan. He said an auto plant wouldn't close. We closed an auto plant. Look, I'm going to tell you something. I said that Donald Trump would win in 2016, and I knew he would because he understood that jobs had been shipped overseas and that the workers were tired of that, and they wanted someone to fight for them. And Democrats did a terrible job on it. I agree with Donald Trump. Let me all surprise you here that I think we should put a tariff on Chinese EVs, and I will work with him. I will work with him, but I hope he's not going to get elected so I don't have to work. But, I mean, I have to say this all sure. carefully. But whatever comes, I'm going to respect the, the voters' wishes because that's democracy. And we do need to make sure that we change the USMCA so China can't build plants in Mexico and then bring them into this country. I don't disagree with him on everything. Do you think that the Democrats and Kamala Harris and Joe Biden did a poor job with the border? I think that, I'm going to be very blunt, that I think Republican presidents and Democratic presidents have struggled with this for decades. And I think we need comprehensive immigration reform, and it's time for everybody to get a backbone. And we had a conservative senator who led bipartisan negotiations in the United States Senate, didn't make the progressives not happy, but people were prepared to move forward with it, and one person stopped it. And that was Donald Trump, because he wanted to have this issue as an issue in the presidential and he denies that he made those well, calls. But it's a fact right? of the matter. So, I mean, that's, but we need to. I don't care who's elected. We need to take comprehensive immigration reform on when the, after this election is done. Because there are so many kids right here in Metro Detroit, and, uh, and we've talked about this, about the fentanyl crisis that's hit every neighborhood and every suburb. I have had big family city. members that have died. Do no, you yeah. think I don't understand that? Of course that? you do. Hey, I want to thank you for joining us. You're going to be with us on election night. I can't wait for that. Thank you. I, I said that out loud. I can't wait for it, because I can't wait till we can actually, actually put this... I am counting the minutes, not the this, hours, the minutes. Cover this the right way and, uh, and hope for a peaceful transition of power. That's what everyone wants. That's the pulse for tonight. Battleground with SE Cup is next. I'm Rup Raj. Have a good night, everybody. Stay here with us.